Then you have St. Margaret coming along, and in 1072 she built onto their church. When Margaret was um, buried in her own church, her youngest son David then decided he would turn his mother's monastery into an abbey. So he decided to demolish his mother's church and build the Grand Abbey over the top. And the only part of the abbey that remains today is actually the nave, the poor man's end of the church, if you like. That was down to the Reformation. In 1560, churches in Scotland were changing religion. And in actual fact, all they did was they walled over down there where the division is today, and they decided just to abandon this end of the church. It seems a very strange thing to do. But they decided that all of the congregation would move into the common man's end of the church and worship there. It lay for 210 years, with this part abandoned totally. And eventually, as the graveyard kept crept closer, the tower became unstable. And when the tower came down, it demolished everything underneath it. It lay like that for another 100 years. And then the town had grown up. It had grown bigger and bigger, and the nave was no longer big enough. So they then had to look to this end of the church again, they cleared the rubble away from there and they built on the floor of the 12th century church. So under the wooden floor here is the stone flagstones that you would have down the side aisles in the older part. When they cleared the church here, they discovered a tomb. We have eight kings buried here because in 1098, Iona, where all the original kings were buried, was handed back to Norway. And you have a point where no more Scottish kings could be buried on Iona. So they had to look for another royal sepulchre. And because Malcolm III of Scotland was king here, this became the royal sepulchre. We've got eight kings buried here, but one of the most important kings we have here is this one, Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce is buried where he was, but in the 12th century floor. And they quite literally built this church round about him. But they decided when they built, went to build this that they would open a tomb to find out which king was here. And when they opened the tomb, they discovered inside remnants of an oak coffin, remnants of cloth of gold, and a body embalmed in lead, just as the Egyptians would have done with bandages, only with very fine lead. I don't quite know the technicalities of it, but lead apparently preserves bone. And other than a part of the uh, binding at the foot, the actual skeleton is complete. It measures 5 foot 11. 5 foot 11 makes Robert the Bruce roughly 6 feet, or 6 foot 1. Scots at that time, the average height would have been about 5 feet, so even in those days I would have been quite tall, so he must have been quite an impressive man. We also found in here, once they opened the lead, that the breastbone of the skeleton is cut through just as it would have been done in 1329. And that was because Bruce made a promise that if ever he was king of Scots, he would lead a crusade. By the time Scotland was safe enough for him to leave it, he was too old. He was 55. 55 then is the equivalent of roughly 84 today. So he had a good long life, and he did die in bed, which was a wee bit of a bonus for him. It's very rarely they died in bed in those days. So, he asked his friend to put his heart in a casket and lead the army. They got as far as Spain and the Scottish army stopped to help the King of Spain defeat the Moors at a town called Tabor. Unfortunately, James Douglas, who took the heart, was killed there. And the heart came back to Scotland, but not to Dunfermline. It went to Melrose Abbey. So we have his body, but they have his heart. Some night we're going to go down and dig it up and bring it back here. <laughs>